Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Invest Stream. I'm Pankaj and today we're going to talk about early stage investment terms in India. Uh, this is a presentation that I had given at CIE, IIIT, Hyderabad back in January. And uh, unfortunately, there's no video of the presentation, which was uh, a two hour long presentation. But we're going to try and do this a little bit more quickly today. And the idea here is to share some terms that founders should be cognizant of when they're raising money from VCs or angels in India. All right, so let's jump right into it. So who am I? I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail. Uh, I've been an investor most recently, but prior to that, I've been an entrepreneur and a startup operator for many, many years. There's some information here on this slide. Otherwise, feel free to check out some of the podcasts that I've been on in the past uh, and other episodes of Investroom, which I will link in the show notes below. So let's jump into why you're all really here watching this video. So let's get started with a couple of terms to set the tone. Uh, pre and post money. Pre money is the value of a company before raising money. And the post money is the value of the company after the, the investment is completed. So uh, in rupee terms, if you were uh, given a valuation of four and a half crores pre money, and you raise one and a half crores uh, from investors, your post money valuation is six crores. Your dilution is 25%, which is one and a half crores out of the six crore post money. So that's your total dilution. Next, we're going to talk about convertibles, CCDs, and safes. Now, convertibles and safes are primarily used in the US. Um, we do see some variation of this in India these days. Uh, CCDs were a little bit more common, especially with foreign investors. Um, so convertibles are debt, they're not equity. Convertible notes uh, do have an interest rate and theoretically they are supposed to be paid back. But most founder-friendly investors will have a provision in there that convertibles uh, will convert into equity at some point in time based on certain triggers. Like if you raise a Series A of a million dollars or more, the convertible note will automatically uh, get converted into equity. Safes are not debt, but they work very similar to a convertible security for um, conversion purposes. So it's not debt. You as a startup are not required to pay that money back. So it's not a loan. However, there is many times an interest, an interest rate associated with the safe agreement and the conversion provisions are sometimes very similar to a convertible note as well. Safes have become more or less the de facto note for most early stage deals in the United States. So pre-seed and seed mostly are safes these days, but we also do see some equity rounds being done and those are usually using series seed types of documents or slight variations on series seed. Um, a cap is the valuation at which the conversion to equity happens. And a lot of people can confuse what a cap and the valuation are, they are very different things. When you are doing a convertible note or a safe, the company is not being valued at anything. Instead, what is being said is that the cap is the valuation at which the conversion to equity will happen. So as an example, if you have a five mil cap on your convertible note or your safe, what will happen is when the company is valued at $5 million or above, the conversion will happen at a $5 million valuation. So even if your valuation is $10 million and um, your Series A investor is giving you a $10 million uh, valuation, your previous investors will still convert at that $5 million. There is a slight variation, and that is the discount. The discount in percentage terms is a discount to the conversion valuation. So 
what typically happens is uh, investors who invest in a convertible note or safe will usually convert at either the cap or the discount, whichever is more uh, in favor of the investor. Uh, it doesn't happen at both. So you will either convert at the five mil cap or at a 20% discount to the subsequent round. Uh, the interest rate is the annual interest that's paid on a convertible or a CCD. And typically that interest rate is rolled up into the amount of shares that you will eventually uh, receive or the investor will eventually receive. So uh, most of these things are the same for convertible CCDs and safes and they work very similarly. Now talking about dilution. Dilution in India especially is um, something that is also evolving over time. I remember a time where if you were raising any round, uh, your expected dilution was 30%. Um, and fortunately, we've seen those numbers come down, at least for pre-Series A companies. So at a seed or pre-seed stage, uh, founders are diluting at significantly less than 30%. Um, I've seen rounds where founders are diluting about 10% to about 20%. That's pretty common these days. So 20% dilution at the angel round um, is pretty common. Um, I would recommend you try and push it a little bit lower, but 10% uh, option pool also common. Uh, if you can, try to push it to a 5% option pool. Um, at the Series A, you will likely dilute close to 30% probably somewhere in, in the 25 to 30% range. And many Series A investors will ask you to top up your existing option pool to a total of 20% so that there is enough in the option pool to hire uh, senior executives and um, broaden out your team, right? Um, these are ballpark figures. Um, you know, we're seeing more and more companies raising at least two rounds before getting to a Series A. So another reason why you should try and push your early stage uh, dilution down to maybe 10 to 15 percent per round rather than 20 percent per round. And, you know, you'll wind up giving up about 30 percent at the Series A. So, um, you know, I have some examples here and you can kind of read through these, but you should definitely try to keep a close eye on the amount of dilution that you're taking at the early stage. Uh, you know, I try to suggest to founders to look at your total dilution post series A and work your way backwards. And your post series A number should be around 50% for all the founders combined. And, um, work your way backwards. You know, 50% is an idealistic number and your dilution across all founders will probably be less than 50%. But, you know, if it's 40, 45, that's not terrible. If you are at 25 across all founders, that's probably not a great place to start. So just kind of keep that in mind um, and push back on investors that are trying to dilute you more than you need to be diluted. All right, let's talk about board of directors now. Board of directors um, typically is a big ask for most investors um, at the early stage. Uh, I've seen angels ask, especially angel networks, ask for a board seat. My advice to you is push back on this hard. Uh, there really isn't that much of a need for an angel investor to be on the board of the company. If they are writing a large check uh, out of your round, okay, fine. May, may be reasonable for them to ask for a board seat. Uh, but, you know, ask them to say, look, once you raise a Series A, uh, the investor should resign and give up that seat to the Series A investors. Um, 
another reason why you might want a board seat uh, to go to one of your early angel investors is if they are known to be somebody who is very helpful with the product, with marketing, <clears throat> with introductions to other downstream investors or anything like, you know, if they have a very strong reputation, uh, then it's sometimes useful to have them on the board, but it's not necessary. And Indian investors like to be on the board, but uh, I've seen plenty of deals where they were convinced that it wasn't necessarily in their interest to be on the board. So that's okay also. Um, you can also offer some of these people a board observer position. So a board observer is not a board of director member. They are instead observers. They have no voting rights at the board level. They can just observe what is happening at the board and they will have access to the information that is shared with the board. Vesting. This is another topic that um, can be a little bit of a challenge for investors and for founders. When you're starting a business, you think you own your business, but you actually don't if you're going down the venture capital route. Uh, you wind up earning your equity. You don't own it yet. So the vesting clock usually starts when you start working for a company. Um, founders typically vest um, on a monthly basis and employees uh, usually have like a one-year cliff of 25%. In some cases, I have seen investors ask investors to restart the four-year or five-year or three-year vesting cycle um, when they close the round. Uh, you should push back on this because... What it essentially means is if you've spent two years building a product and now you're raising a seed round of, let's just say, a million dollars, that those two years that you've worked on this company are washed away and you're restarting that clock the day the Series A closes, uh, the seed round closes. So um, investors are trying to lock founders in. And if the founder has to leave or wants to leave, then that equity goes back to the company and there's less dilution for some of the other investors. So it's something that people do ask for, push back on it. Um, unless there's a really, really good reason to restart that clock, to just don't agree to it. Um, if and when a founder does leave, those shares that that founder has invested yet are usually bought back by the company at cost. So there's no price negotiation. The price of the stock when you bought it is the price of the stock when you sell it back if you leave uh, before. And uh, that might be the same if you are asked to leave as well as if you decide to leave on your own accord. All right, next we got Pari Pasu. Uh, pari Pasu is a legal term, as, so anytime the issue of Pari Pasu comes up, you should talk to your lawyer and you should talk to your lawyer, not your investor's lawyer. And in India especially, we see very often where your lawyer is the lawyer that was suggested to you by the investor. Uh, don't do that. Have your own lawyer who represents the startup's interest. As a startup founder, you should probably have your own personal lawyer who's different from the startup lawyer. So that lawyer represents your personal interest and the company lawyer represents the company's interest. Um, if you are paying the legal fees for your lawyer, you should ensure that that lawyer is not representing the quote deal and definitely not representing the investors in any sort of way. They are fighting for your rights and for the company's rights. So uh, definitely do that. It essentially determines the capital stack seniority. And what I mean by that is generally what we see is investors who come in later have the right to... Uh, the top of the capital stack. So essentially, the investors who came in earliest and took the most amount of risk uh, are subordinate in the capital stack to the investors who came in later 
And the founders are usually subordinate to all of the investors. So it helps to understand how Pari Pasu works. And when you're raising money and it's being negotiated, uh, it's it helps you to understand where you fall on the capital stack, as well as what some of your other investors, where they fall on the capital stack also, meaning who's going to get paid out first and who's going to get paid out last. Uh, usually it's not a terrible problem, but in some cases it is. There are instances where you have publicly uh, or pre-IPO companies that are raising a round of funding. The last investor to come in is going to wind up putting in a large chunk of money and they're going to demand that when the company goes public, they have the right to exit first. Um, and Pari Pasu is very closely linked to the next topic, which is liquidation preference. The liquidation preference pretty much says who gets paid first and how much when the company gets acquired or shuts down or, or IPOs. So um, as I was saying before, it is very closely linked to Pari Pursu. Uh, there are plenty of instances where I have seen somewhat onerous liquidation preferences, um, 2x participating liquidation preference is particularly evil, <laughs> especially for an early stage company. What does that actually mean? It means if I come in and invest 100 rupees in your company and I have a 2x participating liquidation preference, the first thing that's gonna happen is if you're selling the company, I get 2x of my investment. So that's 200 rupees that I get back, great. Now, what happens afterwards is if I owned 10% of the company, I also get 10% of the remaining uh, amount of capital that is coming into the investor. So, you know, if let's do this example a little bit better. Um, if your company's worth a thousand rupees and I invest 100 rupees with a 2x participating liquidation preference and you then decide that you're going to sell your company for 2000 rupees so you sell your company for 2000 rupees the first thing that happens is i take 200 rupees right off the top okay that 200 rupees goes into my pocket because i invested 100 and i have a 2x on that now what's remaining is 1800 rupees and because i own 10 percent of the company I immediately will take an additional 180 rupees and put that in my pocket. So I've walked away with 380 rupees out of your 2000 rupee sale. So every other investor and the founders are now left to divide up the 1620 rupees that is remaining. All right. So you want to stay away from any sort of participating liquidation preference. You want to keep your liquidation preferences to a non-participating liquidation preference. And that essentially means that if you own 10% of the company, the company gets sold for 2000 rupees, you get your 200 rupees and you go away. And everyone gets a share that is equal to the amount of ownership they have in the company. So try, try to keep it as simple as possible to a non-participating liquidation preference. Information rights. So information rights is probably one of the lesser debated terms that you'll see uh, from investors, but you know it's important to know what information rights entails. Generally, it entails your financials and uh, materials that might be shared with the board, right? And so this could be, hey, this is what our strategic plan is for the following six months. This is uh, a pr new product rollout that we're doing um, or, you know, some analysis on the market that has changed since you started the year, or, you know, just strategic information uh, as well as financial information. Um, and sometimes it also includes data about where which direction the company is going. So usually as an investor, whether and this is true for angels as well as VCs, they need to see some information about what's happening in the company, right? Uh, but as the company progresses, the angels and super early stage investors may not have as much of a say in how things are going uh, any further 
um, because you have brought on additional uh, investors, larger investors that are taking a much more involved approach in uh, the company. So let's say Series C onwards or Series B onwards. And a lot of those investors generally might not want a lot of information going to other investors uh, for fear of that information leaking to competitors or um, just they want to retain some control themselves uh, and they don't want other people meddling in that. So uh, information rights sometimes do fall away from investors. Sometimes that's triggered by the ownership levels that you have. Uh, but at the very least, most early stage VCs will continue to ask for some sort of financials uh, just so that they can continue reporting uh, in a uh, proper way to their investors. So just something to be aware of and know why people are approaching it a certain way. Redemption and drag along rights are particularly problematic from what I've seen. Um, we don't really see these in the U.S. at early stages anymore, uh, primarily in safes and convertible notes and uh, Series C docs. They just don't exist. Uh, sometimes you might see some of these things in later stage uh, Series A, Series B types of rounds, but usually not in early stage rounds. Now, these provisions can be problematic because so the problem with redemption rights are you can essentially force the founders or the company to buy back the investors shares at fair market value i've seen clauses where and this is angels at a really early stage will put in a redemption right that says uh, the company must buy back their shares in five years or seven years or 10 years or 20 years at a minimum 5x right and i haven't seen investors actually uh enforce this but i have seen the language in legal documents on a regular basis and it's ridiculous because you can essentially bankrupt the company by forcing it to buy back uh, the investor's shares at a predetermined multiple. Uh, kind of ridiculous. And it blows my mind that investors still put this in. And I blame lawyers in India for a lot of this. They just they force a lot of things into these legal docs that make no practical sense whatsoever. So if you've got a good lawyer, well, get your lawyer to push back hard on all of these things and really make a logical case to the investor as well as to the investor's lawyers about why this is meaningless and it shouldn't be there. No one's going to spend 20 years in court fighting this out. So just take it out. It doesn't make any sense. Um, drag along rights are a little bit different but related where if the investors are deciding that they're going to sell their shares, they can force founders to also sell their shares. So common, um, haven't seen it happen often, but it does happen, uh, And but it is common. If you can get it removed, fantastic, uh, especially at the early stage, you know, pre-Series A types of rounds. All right, next is the ROFR as it's, lovingly called or the right of first review refusal um, typically any founder common stock that's being sold needs to first be offered to investors that hold the right of first refusal not all investors hold the right of first refusal but if you the founders want to sell your stock you have to first offer it to the investors who have a right of first refusal and if they choose not to, or if there is a built-in uh, expiry limit, so, hey, if the investor doesn't respond in 24 hours, you can sell it to whoever you want. Uh, that's fine. Uh, I've seen stuff like that also, and that's normal. Um, 
investors that have co-sale rights uh, essentially means that if you, the founder, have said, hey, I want to, you found a buyer for some stock and you want to sell it, and you go to the investor who says, hey, I have right of first refusal, but I don't want to buy any of the stock, turns around and you say, okay, I'm going to sell my stock, you, the founder. And now the investor can turn around and say, oh, by the way, since you're selling your stock, we want to sell some of our stock as well because we have co-sale rights. So the total amount that you, the founder, can sell might actually be smaller if the investors decide that they want to exercise some of those co-sell rights. Um, typically, there's no time limit on these rights that are held by investors. So you know, even an angel investor uh, might have these rights even though you raised a Series D by then, right? Um, it's pretty common. But you know, if you can get rid of it and simplify the docs, might as well. Right, and that, that's my opinion. And this is why I like the SAFE agreements and uh, series seed equity documents in the US as well as um, CCDs that make some of these things simple. Um, the last real slide here is some resources that I think are helpful and useful. Uh, definitely check them out. Um, and that's about it. So, you know, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. I'm P. Jane. And check out some of the videos that I have put up on investstream.co or just go to investstream on YouTube and subscribe and, you know, hit a whole bunch of like buttons and uh, comment and ask questions. And with this video also, please feel free to ping me on Twitter or ask questions or comments uh, in uh, on YouTube, and uh, I will try to answer whatever questions you have, either uh, by responding in the comments or just doing another video that uh, uh, answers your questions. So thanks again for listening in. I hope you guys found it useful. Definitely leave some comments and thoughts on uh, what I've talked about. And if you've got other rights that you've seen or terms that you've seen in uh, SHAs that you think are ridiculous or onerous, uh, please share them. Uh, we want to know. We want to see those. And uh, as founder-friendly investors, uh, we think it's important to get rid of those in whatever legal docs that we're a part of. So thanks again, and I will catch you guys soon. Thank you.